Hell is a very mysterious and scary place in the minds of Christians. Some might be surprised to know that there is a wide variety of views of hell among Christian thought. In this video, I, Satan, an expert on hell, am going to discuss a peculiar but interesting view about hell from esteemed biblical scholar Dr. John Walton. He thinks the Old Testament and New Testament writers never believed in hell. Therefore, we don't know much about it. Why would he think such a thing? And what would such an idea change about how we view hell today? Okay, I'm going. I'm going. I'm going. I'm going. I'm going. Are you kidding me, son? We both agreed that I would do the video on hell. You weren't even mentioned in the Old Testament. How could you say you're an expert on hell? I'm so sorry about that. That guy is such a troublemaker. Sorry. Where were we? Yes. Many read the Bible seeing all kinds of mentions of Hades and Gehenna and Sheol as places describing hell. In this video, I, Moses, will talk about how Dr. John Walton strongly disagrees with this idea, but rather thinks the Bible gives us very, very little information on what happens when non-Christians die. For those that don't know, Dr. John Walton is one of the most highly esteemed biblical scholars on the Old Testament and the ancient Near East. Basically, he's an expert on what people thought during that time period in that region. He's evangelical and a conservative Christian. He believes in the historical Adam, for example. So why would an evangelical and conservative Christian like Dr. Walton say something so shocking like hell is never mentioned in the Old Testament? The reason is simply because, well, there's no mention of the word hell in the Old Testament. But of course there's the Hebrew word Sheol, that's hell, right? Not according to Dr. John Walton, baby Leviathan. He argues that what we think of hell was extremely different than how they described Sheol. What was the Jewish, the ancient Israelite conception of hell? They had none. They did not have any sense of reward or punishment after death. They um, understood the netherworld as a place they called Sheol, and everybody went there. It was not a place of reward. It was not a place of punishment. Uh, and that's really all they had, that their nephesh, their self, their person. thats It's a word that sometimes is translated soul, okay. but that's not really a Hebrew mm. conception. Um, so their, their self, their personness um, would... Uh, would then go to the netherworld, would join with the um, the community of the ancestors in the netherworld, and in that sense form a community in a netherworld context that had some connections to the community that continued to live. Whether to you were good them, or bad. Whether you were good or bad. What's interesting is that the Israelites have the same general concept of a, of a netherworld that's kind of nondescript, uh, the same as the peoples around them except Egypt, had. Uh, but nowhere in the Bible do they go into all of that detail about it. The most detail we have about a netherworld context is Isaiah 14, where the king of Babylon, who has been sent to the netherworld, is greeted by other kings, and they say, yeah, you're just as bad as we are now. We're dead. And that's that's about it. You know, okay. there's just not, not a whole lot. Rather... In his book, Ancient Near Eastern Thought in the Old Testament, he lists six things that he thinks we can learn about what the Israelites thought of Sheol, many of which are very different than how we see hell today. He says those in Sheol are viewed as separated from God, though, as previously mentioned, God has access to Sheol. Sheol is never referred to as the abode of the wicked alone. 
while shields never identified as the place where all go, the burden of proof rests on those who suggest that there was an alternative. In other words, everyone in this time period thought they went to Sheol. Sheol is a place of negation. No possessions, no memory, or knowledge, or joy. It is not viewed as a place where judgment or punishment take place, though it is considered an act of God's judgment to be sent there rather than remaining alive. Thus, it is inaccurate to translate Sheol as hell if the latter is, by definition, a place of punishment. There is a, no reference that suggests varying compartments in Sheol. Deepest Sheol refers only to its location, beneath, rather than to a lower compartment. When looking at Israel's neighbors at the time of the Old Testament, like the Canaanites and the Babylonians, we see a very interesting similarity in the views of the afterlife. For this reason, he notes, there is little in this profile that would be foreign to or incompatible with the ancient Near Eastern cognitive environment, though it should also be noted that there are many additional elements within ancient Near Eastern thinking that would be incompatible with Israelite theology. We might say then that Israelite thoughts on the matter would be a smaller circle of ideas nearly entirely encompassed within the larger ancient Near Eastern circle. In other words, while there were differences, the Israelites' core beliefs about Sheol and the afterlife were the same as the Israelites' surrounding neighbors. But what did your pastor didn't tell you, host guy? Yes, baby Leviathan? Did the Old Testament not come straight from God with no influence from other pagan cultures because that would surely taint God's inspired and perfect book? Well, what does John Walton say about that? That would be a problematic way of thinking because both Old Testament and New Testament are thoroughly embedded in their cultural contexts. That doesn't mean they're borrowing pagan literature. It just means that they're part of that way of thinking. And God addresses people in terms of the ways that they think in their culture. So again, God doesn't drop a cosmic geography from heaven and say the earth is a globe and it moves around the sun and the moon is a rock in space. And it he talks mm -hmm. to them in terms that they understand. Don't tell Ken Ham that. Okay. And it's the same. Hey, hey, don't start. It's the same thing with um, even when the New Testament talks about hell, it's using the terminology that was culturally understood. It's very difficult to find a passage in the New Testament that offers a teaching about hell mm -hmm. other than the basic idea that you are accountable and there will be judgment for your sin. Okay, that's the Old Testament. What does the New Testament say? Do we see something different there? Um, okay, so then we get to we get to the first century. And now you get you you have in Greek, you have the word Hades being thrown around mm -hmm. in the New Testament, which for some reason I never noticed as a kid because mm -hmm. that was from Greek mythology at public school, not from Sunday school. But mm -hmm. Hades is in the New Testament. And then hell, which is Gehenna. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sometimes. Then you have Gehenna in mm -hmm. the... in the So, okay, what's the difference between Hades and Gehenna, and why do they use one as opposed to the other? And what do those two things mean? Hades, is it, is it was it absolutely the same as Sheol? Not absolutely. Okay. Um, again, okay, people who grew up in the King James Version, like I did, because yeah. there was nothing else when I grew up, you know, back in the Jurassic period, mm -hmm. and the uh, King James translated Sheol as hell and translated Hades as hell. So we grew up thinking that the Bible, oh. the Old Testament, talked about hell okay, all over so the place. Hell, so the in the King James, hell is in the Old Testament. Oh, yeah. It's Sheol. Yeah, Sheol. Yeah. And so uh, you, you grow up thinking that it is talking about it's hell. It's just hell, hell, and hell. Sometimes they say the grave, okay, the interpreter's yeah. choices there. But that's also true with Hades. Hades uh, could be talked of specifically as a generic netherworld, an afterlife, mm -hmm. um, or something. Sometimes it was used to refer to a place of punishment. Mm -hmm. um, so that word had its flexibility, and we see it used both ways. Okay. Um, Gehenna is a Greek adaptation of Hebrew terminology. You've probably heard this mm -hmm. before, okay? But just for the people out there, valley or for of Christian. the son of Hinnom. 
right? Yep. Gay Ben Hinnom. Yep. Gay Ben Hinnom. Yes. Because which the, later became Ben Gay. Yeah. The, hold on, hold on. You're confusing me. All right. A so, wonderful product. So Gehenna <laughs> that relieves is pain the and suffering. valley of, of the, the valley of Hinnom. Right. And the valley of Hinnom is the valley that cuts from the southern part of the city of Jerusalem around to the west, and it's the place where the children were burned to the god Molech. Dr. John Walton clearly thinks there was a change in understanding of the afterlife from the Old Testament compared to the New Testament. But how does he explain how this change happened? Once you get past the Iron Age with the Israelites and the Babylonians and the Assyrians and all of those which make up the ancient Near Eastern way of thinking, you suddenly get Persians. Persians for two centuries, three centuries. No, they they just (laughs) conquered. They invaded. (laughs) They conquered. And And they brought with them packaging. Persian (laughs) thinking, Zoroastrianism, dualism, all kinds of different ways of thinking that were not current in Assyria and Babylonia and Israel and Egypt. And so you get 200 years plus of Persian influence. And then there's this guy named Alexander the Grape. Uh, <laughs> Not great. the details version. Yeah. <laughs> Alexander the Great, and you get to the Hellenistic flow through. And so you get two serious, lengthy influxes of new ways of thinking that change things considerably. The New Testament is a Hellenistic Greco-Roman world, which is very different from an ancient Near Eastern world. Interestingly, we see similar depictions in Jewish, Roman, and Greek texts of the same time period as well. Christians have taken a number of different approaches to this throughout history. As Dr. Walton mentioned, the KGV and many modern translators clearly saw Sheol, Hades, and the like as the same place. Hell. The Old Testament is just vague enough about Sheol that if you read some things as metaphorical and certain things as literal, you can make them fit. The motivation, of course, is that if the Bible is inspired by God, it has to be inerrant and therefore can't contradict on the views of hell. This, of course, assumes that Sheol, Hades, and Gehenna are all hell, which isn't really justified by their descriptions. This, combined with no real mention of heaven in the Old Testament, has led many to conclude that good people before Jesus went to neither heaven nor hell, but rather something like Abraham's bosom, which is described by Jesus in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Of course, this idea of Abraham's bosom was never mentioned in the Old Testament, and also assumes Jesus is sharing supernatural knowledge of where people go when they die, rather than acknowledging that Jesus might not have actually believed that was a place where people go, you know, considering it was a parable used as a teaching point. Scholars like Megan Henning have pointed out how teachers of Jesus' time would often mention ideas of the afterlife as teaching points without requiring the speakers really believed it was actually happening. Of course, opposite of these views, Dr. Walton sees the Bible from a different perspective. He points out how the biblical mentions of Sheol, Hades, Tartarus, and Gehenna have eerily similar descriptions as the texts of the ancient Near East, and therefore conclude that God is using the people of this time period with their own preconceived notions of the afterlife to convey principles other than what happens to bad people when they die. The logic, as described in his book on demons and spirits, is that if we see a view of something in the Bible, which was extremely similar to a view that was held by people outside the Bible at the same time period, it is reasonable to conclude that God isn't attempting to teach that as a theological doctrine. In this way, scripture is still inspired and inerrant in what it aims to teach not every little thought that occurred to the writer of a biblical text as they were writing, just like God used people who believed the heart was the center of the emotions, people who thought the world was flat and had a solid dome. He took people where they were located in their time and place, didn't fix all of their faulty beliefs, but used them where they were to communicate more important truths which didn't include what happens to the bad people who die. In fact, we can put it in a different way. We can confidently say that God probably did not give them a special revelation, a mystical vision on a specific view of hell because the thoughts and beliefs are so similar to their culture. It just wouldn't make sense for God to give them a vision from God, special knowledge, to write something down that they already believed. As Walton says, 
And there was no revelation that they received on that. So they're not getting, this is God's word about the afterlife. They had their ideas that are not like Egypt's, but they are like what you find in Mesopotamia among the Babylonians, Assyrians, Aramaeans. Okay, so say you find this view possible, if not likely. What should we believe about Sheol, Hades, Tartarus, and Gehenna? based off of the Bible. Sin has consequences that are bad. <laughs> okay, okay. And grace has consequences which are good. But those okay. consequences, unlike in the Old Testament, continue on post-death. Yes. Is that another one of your points? Because well, uh, I'll make it a different number. Well, I, I was going to go with number two is okay. uh, people are held accountable. Okay, sin has consequences. People are held accountable even if not in this life. Yes. So you might not get kicked off your land like yeah. the Israelites right. were. But you, there's still... But your castle may not be as big. <laughs> there are no castles. Hell. Whatever hell is, and there are lots of different opinions, it certainly involves separation from God, and perhaps that is the very worst part of it. But the text really doesn't talk in those terms. Um, I kind of like what Millard Erickson says in his uh, theology book. Sin is man saying to God throughout his life, go away and leave me alone. Hell is God's finally saying, you may have your wish. You know, it Mm -hmm. gives us that kind of sense of it. When Mm -hmm. people choose to identify solely for themselves instead of identifying with God. Remember, in the end, it's God's business what takes place. We know what's expected of us. We know what kind of response God wants, and we know that God will just... So it's kind of simple. That's it. You're telling us we have this whole biblical text which was inspired by God for our teaching and yet tells us next to nothing about where bad people go when they die? You really expect us to believe that? Oh, baby Leviathan. I can see why that might be completely unexpected and very different from what we've assumed the purpose of the Bible is. If you remember, the Bible never says it would answer every question for us that we want to hear. Is John Walton's view of hell correct? I don't know. But whatever it is, we must remember that what we want from the Bible isn't always what God's purpose of the Bible is. Just like how the inspiration of the Bible probably didn't occur like we would normally expect by God taking control of all the writers to write each and every book, or by downloading the words into their brains that he wanted to put on the page. He did it quite differently. I think we have to be real with ourselves that this might also be one of those times where our intuitions of how we think God does things could be wrong. It might be an uncomfortable feeling, but the truth is what matters after all. Anyways, I hope this has been a helpful video for you. We discussed the views of the afterlife, as well as what the neighbors of the Israelites believed. What do you think? Did Dr. John Dwan get something wrong? Comment your thoughts in the comment section below, and don't forget to subscribe for more things like this, or press on the video above for views on Hill. Thanks again to my Patreons and supporters of the channel. Until next time!